Good evening to everyone present here tonight. My name is Brian and I'll be your host for tonight. On behalf of the JPO family, we'd like to extend a warm welcome to everyone tuning in for tonight's broadcast. We hope that everyone is doing well and staying safe indoors. A friendly reminder to maintain good hygiene at all times and maintain social distancing when heading out. As you would like to continue improving your experience with us, please help us achieve this by completing the poll that will be published during this broadcast. To anyone who is interested in sharing tonight's broadcast, a live feed is being shared on the JPO YouTube channel. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please feel free to type them out in the Q&A section down below. For those, of us, for those of you watching from YouTube, please type your questions out uh, down in the live chat down below. A recording of the webinar will also be uploaded onto the YouTube channel. Tonight's seminar features Ms. Lin Kao, with a topic being a new and creative way of making music. As our JPO family attendees are mostly students ranging from primary school to college, their parents and their teachers, the sharing of knowledge and advice here for all of us tonight is invaluable and greatly appreciated. The JPO is very honored to have Miss Cow join in as our guest for tonight. I hope they will all join me in giving her a warm welcome. Miss Lin Cow is regarded as one of the most inspiring Asian American female conductors of her time. Similar to Leonard Bernstein, her career took off after an astonishing performance of the opera Condide, where under short notice, she conducted the Hedisha Starts Orchestra, Wiesbaden. Miss Kao greatly impressed her audience with both her skills as a conductor and a pianist. After a remarkable performance of the Mozart Piano Concerto Number no. 23, the FAZ, which is a major newspaper in Germany, even described her as the magician of the evening. At age 10, Miss Kao earned the opportunity to serve as the assistant conductor of the Taiwan Youth String Orchestra in Guangming Academy. Whilst in the US, she has collaborated with many orchestras and youth orchestras, such as the Young Artist Philharmonic Orchestra in Stanford, the Hartford Youth Symphony Orchestra, as well as the Houston Sinfonietta, serving in both soloist and conductor positions. In Europe, she has led operas such as the Wiesbaden State Opera, the Hof State Opera, and the Darmstadt State Opera. As a pedagogue, she has inspired many young musicians in the Silver Mine School of Music during her term in during her term from 2003 to 2005. She also served as the assistant instructor at Indiana University from 2005 to 2007. In Germany, she was an assistant professor at Essen Folkwang University and guest instructor at the Cologne School of Music, while being the resident pianist and conductor at the Wiesbaden State Opera House back in 2007 to 2014. With her love for working with young musicians and through inspiration from her mentor Bernstein, Miss Cow started a Young People's Concert series in 2015. Her creation of Open Trailer was performed around the world and was scheduled to make a return with a sequel, but unfortunately has, been, uh, has currently been put on hold due to the pandemic. Ms. Kao also founded the Simply Diamond Talent Agency and Virtual Music with Lin in order to support young people pursuing the arts field and further bolstering the spirit of music making during the COVID pandemic. Ms. Kao's video productions have now been shown on several TV and radio stations with her newest production alongside Virtual Music with Lin featuring the fabulous cellist Maria Kliegel in the premiere of Locatelli's Cello Sonata Second Movement arranged for a cello orchestra by the talented young cellist, composer, and previous guest of ours, Manuel Lipstein. So without further ado, once again, a very good evening to Miss Cow. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Brian. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction. Lots of greetings from New York City um, and actually good evening to all of you and good morning from here. I actually, as you see, chose a background that's a little bit like evening so that I can feel a little bit more like I am with you guys um, in the same time zone. Um, it is so wonderful to be here. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Um, I want to extend a huge thanks to the JPL and teacher Yip Ling for me to uh, be here tonight. So um, yeah, thank you so much. I look so forward. It's a great honor. <laughs> thank you. The audience always for having you join uh, for having you join us tonight. 
and um, with relation to what you were saying just now, well, uh, it does come, kind of, uh, it does correlate because you're at night, you're having a night background while I'm having the daytime background over here. <laughs> See, already a culture exchange in the best way, you know, even the time zone match. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> All right, so um, so to start, to start tonight's interview, what can you tell us about the video that we had just watched? I chose the video very specifically because that was um, recorded from the pit. I don't know if you guys know about the opera stage. So basically the orchestra is in the pit lower and it's just a pit camera. I actually didn't think anything was going to come out of it. I was ready to just have the video taken because as all conductors do, and I'm sure also a lot of the other musicians, we tape ourselves in order to learn from what we do. And on that day, I was called, I was in Berlin, actually. I was watching um, an orchestra Hauptprobe, which is the second rehearsal before the premiere of Rosenkavalier by Barenboim. He was doing a rehearsal and I was watching. And I got this panicked phone call from these Baden Stadt Theater where I was working. Lynn, where are you? Where are you? I was like, yeah, I, I, uh, I told you guys I'll be in Berlin watching this Orchestra Hopeful of Byron Boy. We need you to come back. Why? Yeah, because our conductor is sick. Nobody has time. This and this, that person. I was like, okay, one, just one second. I was at Berlin. Okay, that's five hours train ride away oh from God. Baden, And our performance was starting at 7.30 in the evening. So I was like, oh my God, I have to go, I have to run. And then of course I missed the train, lost my luggage, everything that could ever happen happened, but I didn't make it at 7.25. I thought I was changing in the train station, I was changing in the train station and on the um, taxi ride, got into the garden in the pit and then I conducted and it was one of the best experience ever. It was so much fun. The orchestra was making music with me and everybody on stage was synchronized with my conducting because they know I was just rushing back <laughs> to conduct this performance. And that ended up being one of the, yeah, the start of my career. So it was very exciting time, very funny, very chaotic, but, um, but one of the best times in my life. <laughs> and also, all also the ends well, aside from the aside from the trip to getting there. <laughs> all right. So, um, so with regards to your career as a pianist, so when and why did you start your piano lessons? I started probably a lot like um, a lot of the people that's watching now at a very young age. I started at age four, okay. and uh, it was not because. I wanted to learn or my mom wanted me to learn. It was more like I, I took ballet when I was three. Mm -hmm. My dance teacher said to my mom, Miss Wu, you know, your daughter has such a great feeling of rhythm. I think it'll be wonderful if she will be learning an instrument. And later on, my mom told me, you know, Lynn, you, could, you just could not sit still. She said, when she brings me to restaurants, I will be on the chair dancing and stuff like this. So she realizes music rhythm is definitely something that I love. And this is when I started the piano lesson. I mean, not because uh, we had a huge music family or, but I have to say my mom was a very great music love. And I think um, I was very lucky to have her support to send me to school, to send me to different instructors and, um, I started with the Yamaha program, which is a lot of fun because we did ear training and stuff like this. So this is how I grew up. I did already at age four, I did group lessons and I did private lessons. So that's how I started piano. And that's when everything started. All right, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I, I did go over the Yamaha program as well. So I can understand like that whole love of the, like the hearing and the group and the group lessons as well. So yeah, that was definitely something interesting to hear. I mean, it was a lot of fun, isn't it? Like they call you when you're a little kid, you're there and you have like six of them together and you run yeah. up there and you're putting your little stickers on this. It's, yes. It was a good experience, <laughs> good experience. Yeah, then there's all the different songs where you guys play on electones together and stuff like that as well. Yes. <laughs> um, so moving on. So when was your first conduct? Uh, so as we mentioned earlier, your, conduct your first conducting experience was back in Taiwan back yes. when you were 10 years old. So right. how, uh, could you describe this experience? How was it doing, uh, doing this experience? Oh gosh, it was certainly not as smooth as my Condit performance. It was very funny actually, because um, my piano teacher, Miss Liang, she is the sister of uh, 
Professor Chen, who was doing the conducting for the um, Taiwan Youth String Orchestra. And I have been sitting in, watching the rehearsals and things like that. And just because um, I was very interested and Ms. Liang said that it would be very good for me to get involved, understand the different colors of sound because as a pianist, even though we have 88 keys, that's black and white. We have to play like a singer. We have to play like an oboe. We have to have a string sound. This is how um, I create different colors on the piano. So we were, um, so Professor Chen was rehearsing the Schubert Fifth Symphony, one of my favorite symphonies actually, so gorgeous. And he was talking to one of my peers who is older and was more advanced on how to start the piece. Now, there is, of course, one could start in four if one wants to do it the more old fashioned way with a slower tempo, but it's really very slow. Da, 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 da. One could do it. And there was a talk if one wants to have a faster tempo, one could do a very clear too, which is. And then during the lesson and during the rehearsal, Professor Chen has said it's probably the best if you do a half, two, like between a four and a two, and then going to a two, which will be something like just so that the 16th in the beginning, it's very clear. I got so confused. I had all those informations in my head. So I was conducting a half two with like a four. So, so everybody was playing like some played in two, some played in four. So I was like, I was like, oh my god, it was a completely horrible experience. I wanted to quit, of course, right afterwards. You know, I was like ten. I didn't know any better. But um, but needless to say, uh, I never made that mistake twice. <laughs> I always had my beginning very very clear. I always know my twos. I always know my fours. But I guess that's uh, why you learn from your experience. A lot of times we learn the best from our mistakes. Yes, <laughs> agreed. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so when did you leave Taiwan to move to uh, the U.S.? How was the experience there? Was it a big culture um, shock, uh, cultural difference uh, between Taiwan and U.S. back then? Yes, very much so. I mean, the funny thing is even the weather was so different because I arrived in America. I remember after like a 26 hour flight, we had a layover in, uh, in uh, uh, what is it called? Alaska. Oh, okay. And, um, and what happened was we arrived in JFK. I had motion sickness. I did not have a very good flight. And I got out there. I was like, I saw this white thing falling from the sky. I was like, what is this thing? What is this white thing falling from the sky? And it was snow. Oh. I, I've never seen snow in my life. I, I don't know if there is snow in Malaysia, but in Taiwan, <laughs> there's no snow, no. you know? So I got out of the car after 26 of a, a flight very tired. It was, I think it was like one o'clock in the morning, we finally arrived. And I saw this thing flying down. And my mom is like, yeah, this is called snow. But this is, in a way, how different it was for me as like a 10, 11 year old coming to a completely different country. I didn't speak the language. I had to um, go to English second language for a year. Um, to learn English, and then I skipped a grade to went directly to the eighth grade. And it was very different for me because I think a big part of Asian culture in which I think it's so great is we have a lot of discipline. We are very humble. We um, listen to authority. We follow rules and we are very hardworking. And in America, it was very much, it was for me very different because all they want is they want to hear what I think. What is my idea? They want me to create. And this was something that I am not used to at all. You know, so in a way, I was waiting for somebody to tell me what to do because I'm used to it. And because following instructions and doing it well is, high, is viewed so highly in Asian culture, I did not know how to deal with it in the beginning because um, teacher will be like, okay, Lynn, what do you think? And I'll be like, I don't know, what do you think? They're like, no, 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 I want to know what you think. So this in a way uh, was, it made a big 
awakening in my head. And I realized, yes, it is wonderful to have this wonderful Asian culture of discipline, of working hard, of following instructions and doing it well. But at the same time, people want to hear our voice, you know, what we think, what is our experience. And that's why I also share with you yesterday, Brian, when we had the rehearsal, that I believe life experience makes us wonderful musicians because it's from these experiences within us. And when we understand what they are all about, we can share it with our um, audience, which is so precious. Yeah, definitely agree. There's definitely like it's definitely uh, a good thing to experience like both like both extremes there. So, yeah. Yes. yeah, very much so. <laughs> so, um, so who's your favorite conductor, and why is this person your favorite conductor? Oh, well, it's hands down Carlos Kleiber. Do you oh. know Carlos Kleiber by any chance? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> yeah, he is a wonderful conductor. He, um, his father was also a very important conductor as well, Erich Kleiber. And I fell in love with his conducting when I saw he conducted 1979 Fledermaus with the Tokyo Symphony Orchestra. Oh, okay. And I thought, what is this guy doing? He is yeah, he's conducting, but he is dancing. I mean, for me, his conducting is so much like dancing because you can read every single gesture in his body of what he wants to do, what he wants from the orchestra, what he wants from the music. It is so clear because a lot of times um, as an orchestra member, I don't know, what, what instrument do you play? Do you play piano? Do you play the violin? Do you play in the orchestra, Brian? Yep, um, I play the piano and the violin, so yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. wonderful. So yeah. I can imagine that you know exactly what I mean. Sometimes orchestra members will say, well, I'm sorry, this, this upbeat is not clear. Could you do it again? Or this transition is not clear. Very often that happens in opera. People ask me, well, Lynn, could you do this transition once more? It's not as clear. With Carlos Kleiber, it was always clear. It was always clear of what he wanted. Now, granted, I think he chose these pieces that he conducts very carefully. I think he conducts a handful of operas. He conducts like the Bohème, the Fledermaus, the Golden Cavalier. So he has a very specific repertoire that he conducts, but he okay. conducts them with his, the tip of his little finger. You know, he knows the piece so well. He can share that with the orchestra, share that with the audience. And this is something that I'm really impressed about is the fact that he not only prepare himself very well, he can also show it so clearly with his physical ability. Yeah, so this is something that I definitely will say one of my favorite conductors for sure, Carlos right. Black. But I'm, but I'm sure that you're trying. I'm sure that you're following in this so because based on your like based on the videos that we saw, you do show a lot of like emotion there as well. So yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um. So uh, with respect to uh, your career as a pianist, then who is your favorite pianist, and why is this person your favorite pianist? My favorite pianist. It's actually very funny. My, my favorite pianist is um, Rubinstein. I have right. to say, to go very, very old school, because um, one of my favorite composers for all times was Frédéric Chopin. Oh, okay. As a matter of fact, I won, I won the national Chopin competition here in the states, and I was actually represented. Well, I did represented the U.S. Um, in the international Chopin festival in Tushniki. So I've played a lot of Chopin repertoire. I mean, gosh, uh, the 24 Etudes. Okay, not all the not all the waltz, not all the nocturnes. I did um, the sonata. I did all the ballad, all the scherzi, all the. So I played a lot of Chopin, <laughs> and right. I have to say one of the things that I really love about Chopin is is he he writes like a singer. You know, and uh, if I will have to choose an opera, uh, if choose a composer in which I say, which composer do I think writes more like voice, most like voice, 
I will say it's Chopin because he writes all these really um, wonderful running notes that goes and from point one to point B, you have to so elegantly fit like 20 notes in there. You know, it's like, I, it's like the coloratura soprano. I go, la, 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 and then you have to be together. And this is what Rubinstein does so fantastically well, I feel. He really has some wonderful feeling of rubato, of how to fit all these wonderful notes all together from point one to point two and and you don't even know that 20 notes has gone away. You know, it's like what, what makes a good rubato? You have a good feeling of a cello rondo. You do a little bit of relaxation, maybe retardando. So if you have from point one to point B, you have an arc of how the form is of the sentence of the music, then uh, then one calls it a nice phrase. And this is what I find Rubinstein does so well. He knows how to make a fabulous phrase with a wonderful timing of the lines. And of course, also ex ex exquisite pedaling, but especially his ability to make rubatos, I will have to say, makes him one of my favorite pianists. All right. Well, thanks for that. Um, so yeah. before, we move, okay. before we move on, um, I would just like to remind our audience that if you have any questions for us, uh, please feel free to type them out in the Q&A section or for those of you on YouTube uh, in the live chat down below. So, yeah. Um, so, moving on. Uh, so, why, um, so, why did, uh, so, what caused, what, uh, in, sorry. Uh, no what, problem, no problem. <laughs> sorry, just trying to find <laughs> words there. <laughs> so, uh, what inspired you to leave, these, leave the States? Like, what caused you to move to Germany? And how was the experience over there? I went to Germany. Okay, I did my undergrad in Indiana University in piano conducting, and I was about to finish my master's degree when I met somebody who later became a very good cello partner of mine. He was a student of Stacker, Jano Stacker. And he said to me, he was German, well, is German actually. And funny enough, he is now also conducting. He was the principal cellist in Wiesbaden for a long time. And now he's also starting to conduct. And he said to me, and I thought he was being not very polite. You know, he said to me, Lynn, you don't know how, to, you would not know how to make German music until you lived in Germany. I was like, what do you mean? I play Beethoven, I play Brahms, I conduct Strauss. What? He's like, no, 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 it's the culture, it's the understanding. You have to, it's so important. And also because there are so many German Austrian composers that's from this European roots, it's important for you to live there and understand. And I think, I, didn't, I did not believe him, but I felt going there and I was glad that I did it because it's true. Not that it makes us a better musician per se. No, I don't think so. But it really, it made me understand why Brahms wrote his piece at least five different times. That's why he only wrote, you know, four symphonies and, and why Beethoven worked the way he did or why Bruckner is the, because it's a lot. And the culture, I think the German culture, they are, they are wonderful people. I love the German culture very much. They are very earnest, very honest, very hardworking in a way, very, very um, Asian too. Mm, they are very careful. They don't do things very quickly, but in a way, this is how the German music is, isn't it? It's not like Russian. It's not like Rachmaninoff. It's not like Tchaikovsky when you phrase a Brahms phrase or when you look at the orchestration of how Brahms writes, it's like very firm foundation. It's like a big block. And when you make the rubato in, um, in German music, it's very frequently very well scaled, such as a uh, good example is like Wagner's opera. You know, you have like five and a half hours of a lot of going and backwards and a lot of rubato, but you don't feel it. You, it's, it's almost like it's slow and it comes with the emotion and you can, but it's not like a big explosion, you know? So this is, I will say, 
very interesting to live implemented to see how their government works, how their everyday works, how their health system works, because it made me understand why German music are the way they are and why composers such as Beethoven or Brahms or um, that they compose the way they do, which is very fascinating for me, for me. All right. Well, I'm I'm sure that I'm sure that the person that in, that inspired you to go to Germany is glad to hear you say uh, glad to hear you say all of this. <laughs> oh, let me tell you, he gave it to me. He's like, look, I told you so. You know, I was right. I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, we can discuss this for the next forty years. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, we're still very good friends, so it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> That's good then. Uh, so yeah, uh, so. Um, Based um, based on what I've seen on your profile, there's a term that there's a term used called a uh, corepetitor. So, um, like, what exactly is a corepetitor, and how important was it uh, for your conducting career? Would you recommend? Uh, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, would you no, recommend go ahead, go other ahead. conductors to um, like undertake this uh, undertake this position as a corepetitor, whatever it is? Uh, first of all, congratulations on the pronunciation because it's very good. <laughs> <laughs> it's not very easy to say this is something that's that was difficult for me to learn in the German language it's that they're um, they're and they it's it's very different and this is what I train actually very much um non-german speaking singers to sing German they have to first get their vowels and their consonants correctly so congratulations that was very good <laughs> go backwards what is a this is something that German conductors had to go through as their studium, as their studies. It is not like that everywhere. I think that is changing as well these days. You don't need to be a co necessarily to be an conductors now, but a co is basically somebody, you have to play the piano school. You have to be the theater pianist. So you play your Rosenkavalier, you play your Elektra, you play your Valkyrie on the piano, you play your La Bohème and Tosca on the piano so that they can rehearse. So you function as an orchestra on the piano. Mm -hmm. You have to train the singers, you have to know how to sing. So while the singers are singing, you sing all those other parts. You have to play the instrument in the pit, your celesta, your organ or whatnot. You have to conduct backstage conducting you have to learn how to do lights because there are sometimes lighting cues and you have to sing on the stage. Let's say if a singer is sick and they cannot get any replacements, you have to sing on the stage as well. So basically you have to know how to do things from point A to point Z, like the whole nine yards of opera house. And it's, it was not easy. There are times in which I was like, oh my gosh, do I have to do this? Or I'm sitting there in the graben, you know, and the Tauber flute, the Celesta solo is coming and I, my heart is pounding. It's hard. And you're, set, you're sitting there and you're waiting and you're waiting. And this is something that's very difficult being an orchestra pianist is because as a pianist, you just go on the stage and you play. But as an orchestra pianist, you go in the pit and you wait for like an hour and you come back and you have to play the hardest solo that there is ever written for the celesta, you know? So you're really like, you learn how to deal with your nerves as well. And of course they let you, and this is how I started as well. They let you start conducting musicals like Evita, A Kiss Me Kate, uh, Sweet Charity. And then they let you do um, Operetta like Fledermaus, like uh, Landeslechen, and stuff like, to train you. So basically after being a corepetitor, mm -hmm. you understand everything about an opera house, which is a wonderful education. It is not easy. Um, I would recommend it. I think it's very important for a conductor, especially when you want to go into musicals or opera to go through it because it's an experience that you cannot get it anywhere else because you really learn things hands on. All right. So do they so do they only offer this position position in Germany, or something? Yes. At the moment, positions like this, it's more in Europe. Uh -huh. I think in America they have very different. They have the stage pianist. They have the voice coach. They have everything. It's a little bit more like in categories. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but I definitely recommend if I were to go into Europe, go to go into Germany, and if you want to do opera conducting, to definitely try to go for that because you learn a lot. Right well, now, basically expanding your skill set there. So yeah, it definitely would yeah. sound very interesting there. <laughs> All right. So, um, so how um, moving on? So, how was your experience being involved and exposed to so many different cultures? Because, like you mentioned, you started with Taiwan roots, moving on to the U.S., and then you even moved on to Germany, and even as mentioned in uh, your previous video, you even went to Armenia. So, how right. did all this influence your views on music and, in turn, your music career? It. Culture exchange, experience in different cultures is probably the best thing that I can recommend any young musicians or artists to do. I personally believe, as we mentioned at the beginning of the interview, music is life experience. I believe the more you understand about life, the more you understand about your culture the, or other cultures per se, the more you have something to say about music and it was a big challenge because you learn something i mean imagine you learn how to do things one way your entire life and you go to another country and this way is i mean i don't like to call it wrong but it's different they think differently they do things differently they use different words for certain things it was a bit confusing in the beginning because I asked myself, especially as a youngster, well, which way is right? Why do they say it like this in Taiwan and they say it like that in America? And gosh, God forbid, they say it differently in Germany and now in Armenia is again something different. Yeah. And I think one learns to be very open minded and very accepting. Um, to understand that there is no right and wrong, just different. And I think this way, one enriches one's life horizon. One doesn't judge anymore. One take and understands and accepts. And I think in a way, this makes the music also more round, yeah? uh, more open-minded. How did that affect my career? It was very enriching and very interesting because everywhere I go, first I have to learn to speak their language. Now, granted, most people spoke very, very good English. Um, but in order to really immerse in the American culture, well, here is anyways different because here in, in America, I had, to, I had to study, I had to take the placement exam. That's why uh, it's very important for me to speak English fluently. Um, it was not so necessarily um, for me to learn German in the beginning because so many Germans spoke a lot of English, but it was very good for me to learn it. And I have to say, speaking their language brought me more respect from the orchestra members. They thought, they, I think for them, the orchestra and the people from Germany, they say, wow, here is an Asian looking American speaking, English speaking person. They took, or he or she, in my case, she took the time and the energy to learn our language. We appreciate that. Yeah, and I think in a way it enhanced and supported my career because it made me more experimental, more adventurous, more open and have in, in terms have more fun. And I put different dots around the world together for different musicians. And I am very lucky that I can be basically the middle point for these different groups, for these different cultures um, with the culture exchange. For example, this is how I met Manuel. That was your previous guest. I met him through um, Maria Krieger in Germany, and I got him to pop, to come to Armenia to be my soloist, you know, things like that. Uh -huh, and then okay. in return, he got me to um, talk with you guys. <laughs> so we already a lot of culture exchange right here. 
Hmm. Yeah, definitely. Maybe maybe once you do find time to even come to Malaysia, there'll be even more chances for that. <laughs> I would love it because you know because my cousin she was already like, oh my gosh, Lynn, you're having an interview with a Malaysia symphony. I said yes, yes, because um, my my uncle, her father is um, he is still in Malaysia at the moment. Ah, okay. So she was um, so so they were. So we were like, you definitely have to come. I would love to come and visit because I've never been to Malaysia. But you know, after after pandemic, after the COVID, we have to make that happen. Yes, definitely. <laughs> All right. So um, moving on. So why did you start the Simply Diamond Talent Agency? And exactly what is this talent agency, and what does it do? Well, I had the pleasure of being of meeting a lot of great people that supported me along the way. And I have to say, at, at some point, I feel sharing is the best way of making what one has more. Mm -hmm. And I decided I was very much into photography. I was very much into sound producing. I was very much into video editing. So I realized at a very young age how important it is to present yourself well. So basically, it is... Uh, an agency in which you provide PR materials, photos, uh, we mix, we do recordings, we do producing, we do video editing, we present a young artist, not just musicians, you can also be um, an artist, a painter or whatever, whatnot. And we try to, right, we try to present your work in the best way possible with different art, with different music put connections to support young artists and to give them a chance to have a smoother ride into the into the real world, let's say. Hmm. All right. Thank you. Well, that yeah, definitely yeah. sounds like it's definitely going to be very helpful for them. So yeah, it's great to hear that you're doing this. No, it's, it's a pleasure. It's been a great ride. <laughs> That's, good. That's good to hear then. Um, so how about um, how about this other thing, uh, virtual music with Lynn? So when did you start it, and what's the end goal? Well, what does this uh, group uh, aim to do in the future? Well, let's just say I I started the virtual music with Lynn because <clears throat> I miss so much making music with my friends. You know, when this pandemic happened, I was supposed to go to Taiwan and on the way to Taiwan uh, go to Hawaii to do a production of Evita. And and I I don't know about you guys, but I was sitting at home by myself, and I'm a very social person. I love talking. I love going out. I love telling jokes. And all of a sudden, I am constantly in my room, and I thought, you know, this is not going to be good. This is not end well. So I called up my friends and said, you know what? Hey, let's make some music together. So in the beginning, it was just two people making music, and very quickly, it was three people making music. And now basically we have a group of like um, close to a hundred people now from different countries. And some of the clips that you saw that I made um, putting all these boxes together, I produced them and cut the videos. And in a way to keep this live music idea alive, even though we are home by ourselves, because I believe music is such a powerful thing. And at times like this, we need to reach out, we need to make music even more. Yeah. So this is how I started virtual music with Lynn, and I hope that um, that it is will become a platform where it will always be there for musicians to come together, for artists to come together. We also have artists and dancers. We have dancers in virtual music with Lynn, where they dance and do freestyle to the music. And so, yeah, I hope very much this will be a platform where musicians and artists can free express themselves. All right. No, thank once again, as as mentioned with the previous one. Thanks for setting this up. It definitely sounds like a lot of work is going into it. So when? So how? Uh, how long ago did this start? Did this start back in like June or something like that? It started back in like uh, end of February, March ish. Oh, that's quite early. Oh, mm -hmm. all right. Well, that that explains how well, that explains how you guys have managed to get such a following, especially now. Yeah, right, definitely. right. <laughs> all right. So, uh, I think we're running a bit short on time. So, I think we'll uh we'll move on to one more question before we move on to our Q and A section. Sure. Okay. 
Yep. So um, based on your experience uh, working in so many different cultures and orchestras, uh, and based on what you've heard of the JPO, so what are your views on the JPO's activities with regards to the spreading of music's culture? And what would you recommend so that we may further contribute to its spread? Well, first of all, I want to say a huge congratulations. I think what you guys are doing is wonderful. Um, the program that I'm on right now, for example, I think is wonderful for the orchestra, for the young people, for the family, that you spend the time, get different cultures together. My experience with Teacher Yap is wonderful. You are terrific. Uh, my entire experience with you guys has been really, really positive. So it's fabulous. Lots of congratulations. And we had talked a little bit about that you guys are um, thinking about branching out, having a festival in December. I think this is also great. Definitely bring even more cultures and different musicians together around the world. And I have checked your social media. You guys are doing well. I think perhaps that's where one place in which I will suggest for you to be more active. I mentioned yesterday that from um, your official JPO YouTube channel. I did not see any of the recordings, but then I ended up watching um, Teacher Yef's YouTube and it's all there. And I think it's wonderful when one can incorporate that a little bit more because we don't know you yet. And I think because you guys are doing such a great job, more people should know it. And these days, so many things is happening on the social media. You can reach different cultures. You, I mean, I feel like you're just right next door, you know, but we are 15 yes. hours fly away and 12 hours time zone. Yeah, so I will say really, really use that. Use this chance of people are still stuck in their computer screen. Use your wonderful personality, use your wonderful program to, to reach out even more. I think you will get a lot of good feedback. So you guys are doing a great job. All right. Thanks for the many thanks for the many compliments, uh, Ms. Kao. I'm sure that I'm sure the teacher Alvin will be happy to hear all this. And with respect to what you mentioned earlier on about having a positive experience, the feeling is me the feeling is very mutual there. Thank you so much for being uh for, for being so uh cooperative and friendly with um uh, with our program so far as well. So yeah, my pleasure. Definitely, my pleasure. <laughs> definitely looking forward to make uh, like to collaborating even further like in the in the future. So yeah. For sure, for sure. So um, with that, I think we'll start moving on to some of our questions from the Q&A. Okay. Yeah, so we do have a few anonymous questions. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to just need to manage it, manage it a bit, sorry. Um, so we do, uh, so one, one of our first questions, uh, one of our first viewers is just saying, um, hello, uh, hello, Lynn. Um, just just wanted to know, other than the piano, were you required to learn any more instruments as a choir petitor? And ah. you have... Did you have to go into depth, into the depth of every, or, did, or were you even required to even go into the depth of every single instrument uh, within the orchestra? Well, to my luck, no. That's <laughs> <laughs> right. My favorite other instrument, it's probably the cello, because the cello is, you know, I if, if, if one were to ask me, what is your favorite voice type, I will say... <clears throat> A rich baritone, you know, and this is this, this is color of this cello, and it's so gorgeous. I am a talented dancer. I'm a talented pianist. I'm a talented conductor, and I think I'm becoming a talented composer as well. But the string playing is not my thing. <laughs> you know, and then and then you have this calluses and things hurt. Um. So no, I was not required. Do I have I tried it? Yes. I tried, I was, I could not make a sound out of the trumpet. It was like, it was not easy. Um, but I did have to learn thoroughly, but that's through my conducting experience, um, different instruments and how they, how they work. That's why chamber music, I play a lot of chamber music with uh, students of Gingold's, with students of Janos Schager, with students. And that really helped me by playing and accompanying these other instruments, make them understand how they work. And I will go to them, hey, you know what? 
how do you make the sound? Could you make it more like this? Could you tell me, play this and that for me? Let me imitate. So no, um, thank you for the great question. Um, if we play any instruments, no, but we are required to understand them in any way we can. And if we have the talent to play it, great. If we don't like me, then ask. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, <laughs> yeah, I would expect I would I wouldn't have expected you to do even more work outside from what you already mentioned earlier on. So yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for sharing that with us. Um, so yeah, um, so moving on to our next uh, another question from our next viewer. So we have another viewer who is asking a question which I did hope to ask earlier on as well. So how important do you think it is to combine all the different cultures that you've accumulated? that you've experienced, yeah. I think it's crucial. It's crucial. I think, okay. um, let's say I, I, I've I, spent most of my life in an opera house. And if one were to think about what is opera, opera is music, opera is acting, mm -hmm. opera is fashion, costumes, opera is art, staging, Opera is light, different lighting. I mean, for example, you know, you with a light background and me with a, it's brings so much atmosphere. And opera is dancing. Bernstein's Wet Side Story can't go with that. Oh, well, that's not, yeah, that's an opera, sort of musical opera. You cannot go without dancing with that. So I myself love to combine it. And one of my, idols and mentors and I love to see his work is Yo-Yo Ma. He goes to every single country, he combines dance, he combines different instruments, he combines different, he, he is also one of those that draws people together. So I think it's very important to combine these cultures because again, it makes you, it makes your experience more rich and in return, make us, I mean, I don't want to say better. Better is such a judgmental word, but just a fuller, a rounder, a rounder musician. It provides that's a completely point. different experience altogether, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes, exactly, <laughs> totally. Hmm, all right, well, I'm sure, the I'm sure the person asking this is like definitely very happy with your answer there. So yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we do have a question on, uh, we do have a question from someone, another anonymous person, just need to read it off another screen, sorry. So let's see. Um, so what would you do as a conductor if the orchestra doesn't really buy into your interpretation of a certain type of music? That's a very good question. This is difficult. Um, they are different ways. Now I've seen different ways of conductor dealing with this. First way is the hard way, which is, okay, I don't care. I'm the conductor, you do what I do. Bad, this is not what I do. Yeah. Second one, it's also not so great, which is, oh, okay. Well, if you say so, then let's do it. Because in a way, I think a conductor is there to, to very, to lead, but to, to, in a way, but to inspire is a better word. Mm -hmm. I think I would do it personally. I will say, okay, let's have this dis discussion in the break or after the rehearsal. I will probably leave the situation first aside and I'll have a discussion with them. Why do you think about it like this? What is your background? Do you have a reason? Is it just because you woke up on the wrong side of the bed? Or did you hear in another, in a CD? Or did you, and I will listen to what they have to say. And I will say, okay, give me a moment. Let me think about it. I will answer it to you tomorrow. And then I will say, well, based on what I listened to, what you, you, you said, I believe you're right. We do it like this. Or I say, I believe we should still do it like that. Or maybe we say, let's find a compromise. I like to be very open. I like to talk to people about things that work and doesn't work and try to find a compromise. Because in a way, this is my respect to the orchestra members as being a musician, as being a human being, as their life experience. Um, so I take the time and I think time is the most important thing that you can give to a person, to another person. 
um, so that I make him or her or a group feel I take what they think seriously and I think about it. And hopefully, as it is uh, a teamwork, something better comes out. And so hopefully, something constructive does come out of something. Yeah, exactly, that, that's right. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah, that definitely sounds like a very good approach to it. So, yeah, I'm sure that person is definitely happy with how you answered that. <laughs> Excellent. All right, so um, I think we're almost running out of time. So, I think I'll move, uh, I'll move on to our last question for the night. Okay. So, um, so this is some. This is almost close to another one that I tried to ask earlier on. So, with the COVID situation causing everyone to be more dependent on the internet, uh, would this new form of culture uh, for the classical or chamber music community uh, would this be a new form of culture for the classic or chamber music communities? Would I you care to so. elaborate on this? Yep, sorry. I believe so. Uh, I don't know whether or not you guys remember and this is for everybody that's out there listening do you guys even remember when netflix and amazon prime didn't exist could you even imagine back then like when people actually have to go somewhere to go see a movie and i think in a way this is how this new platform is going to be um i think this gives every individual much more chance to to present themselves and to develop individual, to go back to what we said in the beginning, I was asked what I think and not, yeah, my creativity, my feeling of, and I think this gives every single individual groups, chamber music and whatnot, a platform to be themselves and to be creative. And I think this will, in return, enhance, enhance each and each one of us of our feeling of being a musician that also supports ourselves. Because I think a lot of times until now, we wait for a manager, we wait for a teacher, we wait for a peers, we wait for somebody to maybe promote us. But in this platform, what you have to do is you have to set up a live stream. You hopefully have a good mic. You have an instrument and you call your friend. Hey, you know what, friend ABC, let's do some chamber music and put it on the internet. Um, I definitely think this is going to be a new platform. Do I think this is going to replace live music? I don't think so, because there is something about live music with the live feedback of the audience that, ah, you know, you have to be there, you know, and it's like, this is why I... This is why we make music because of this amazing energy and feedback that we get from the audience, we get from our peers. Mm. But I do think this, the entire pandemic COVID live stream will change, will add on, let's say, will add on to the experience of what we have already now. Mm. All right. Well, thanks for that. I'm sure, like, yeah, I'm sure a lot of people, a lot of people are starting to take the initiative, like even, like even with your group, like the virtual music with Lynn, you guys are starting to take the initiative to do a lot of this already. So yeah. All right. Well, thanks for that, Miss Carl. Thank you. Um, so yeah, with that, I think we've just about run out of time for tonight. So once again, thank you so much for your responses early on. So thank sorry, you, everyone. So but, thank you. So sorry, everyone, but we are coming to the end of tonight's broadcast. We would like to remind everyone that our JPO family program will be broadcasted twice a week until further notice. So that's every Wednesday and Sunday. So join us next time with our next guest, who will be revealed at a later date. So more details on this can be found on our Facebook page. A video recording of tonight's broadcast will also be available on the JPO YouTube channel, along with the past webinars and the soon to be broadcasted interviews. So please feel free to share the Zoom, web the Zoom webinar registration link the JPO Facebook page, or even the JPO YouTube channel with your friends and family. So for those of you on YouTube, if you are enjoying our program, please show your support uh, for us by pressing the like and subscribe button. So yeah, you guys have been an amazing audience. And we from the JPO family wishes that everyone stays safe and healthy as we continue to face this crisis together. So uh, I will now be leading the prayer to end tonight's program. So please pray in whatever faith you believe in regarding the COVID-19 pandemic.
We pray that everyone in the world continues to stay strong in surviving through these difficult times and that a solution to the virus will soon be found. We pray for everyone's well-being <clears throat> as we continue to monitor the developments regarding the virus across the world. We pray for the safety and well-being of everyone working and continuing to go to school as we enter the new month of September. We pray for the continued safety and morale of the frontliners who are risking their lives so that they may continue to provide for those in need. So, so once again, thank you, Ms. Cal. Uh, and thank you, thanks, uh, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, good night, and we'll see you, and we hope to see you all next time. Thank you, everybody. Lovely to have you join us. Thank you. <laughs> all right. See you.